Yes, cannabis is still federally illegal, but things are rapidly changing. But before we talk about cannabis, let me tell you about my sister, Sasha. This is my older sister, but don't look that smile fool you. She terrorized me as a kid. <laughs> uh, she has epilepsy and grew up with really violent seizures. Uh, they were so bad that she's dislocated her shoulders and has issues with her knees. And so she had to have surgery. And after the surgery, the doctors prescribed her painkillers. And like many Americans in this country today, she got hooked on those painkillers and became addicted. And she was addicted for many years and struggled with this addiction um, and looked for a better solution. So she beat her addiction. Some people don't get past that, but she did, thankfully. And she paid a heavy price. She didn't have anything to deal with her pain. She tried acupuncture, she tried aspirin, tried meditating, but nothing worked until she found something that changed her life. She found medical marijuana. Today, she takes a compound called cannabidiol, or CBD, as it's better known. It's a non-psychoactive compound found only in the cannabis plant, associated with things like pain relief and anti-seizure and anti-inflammation and a host of other wonder properties in this plant. Today, she has gone from eight prescriptions down to two. It's changed her life. She's pain-free, doesn't have seizures anymore. But for her, she became an accidental pioneer in this new emerging, personalized, democratized medicine. Let's talk about opiates for a second. So if I were to ask somebody in the audience when the, the worst overdose crisis in this country's history was, you might guess the crack cocaine epidemic of the 80s, or maybe the FDA wasn't able to, to stop some bad drugs from getting to folks in the past. Actually, it's today. 100 million Americans deal with chronic pain. That's one out of every three people in this room today. As a result, about 650,000 pills are dispensed every single day that are painkillers and two million Americans are hooked on those pain pills. There's gotta be a better way. There's gotta be a better solution. And coincidentally, maybe not coincidentally, at the time when this opioid crisis is ravaging this country, you have a reform sweeping the world, legalizing cannabis. But who do you imagine when you think about a cannabis user? Is it these guys? <laughs> All right, see, so knocked up, the guys are like you know, smoking a huge bowl in that fishbowl. Snoop. Snoop's an icon, he's been mainstreaming cannabis since he was 19 years old. Most folks don't think about a patient who uses cannabis for pain or other symptoms. They don't think of a daughter, like Lily Rowland, who uses medicine for her epilepsy, that's cannabis. They don't think of a grandmother, like Janice Williamson, who uses cannabis for debilitating arthritis. They don't think of Asaf Parush, who uses cannabis oil to treat his son who was born with cerebral palsy. So I challenge you to rethink when you think about who is a cannabis user. It's a father. To rethink who buys cannabis in the stores. It's a grandmother. To rethink whether illegal means wrong. Is this wrong? According to the federal government, it's illegal, but is it wrong? Let's talk a little more about cannabis. Let's go back in time. Let's go way back in time, 5,000 years. First documented use of cannabis was in ancient China, using cannabis as medicine 5,000 years ago. Same thing goes, ancient Egypt, cannabis used as medicine. Same thing goes in ancient India, a concoction of milk and cannabis was called bong, of all things. <laughs> 2,500 years ago, cannabis seeds were found in a Russian burial mound of a, of a priestess, they call her the Ice Maiden. And I've heard that people are trying to resurrect this strain by like Jurassic Parking it, right? They're gonna call it like Woolly Mammoth or, Puppin's, or Putin's Puppet or something, I don't know. <laughs> ancient Rome was used as medicine Fast forward to revolutionary times. The settlers brought cannabis from Europe to Jamestown, and later George Washington and Thomas Jefferson grew hemp, which is a subspecies of cannabis sativa. It was recognized as medicine in 1850 in the United States, used in tinctures and extracts for many, many years in this country. Then it all changed. Anybody know in the 30s maybe what led to the demonization of cannabis? Just shout it out if you got any ideas. Racism is a very good one, absolutely. There was a racist sentiment that swept from the 1910s to 18s. Uh, it was uh, marijuana emerged as a term to racialize the plant and demonize Mexican immigrants fleeing the Mexican uh, Civil War. Uh, the Great Depression was in the 30s as well. People without jobs, people are hurting, they're looking for something to blame. Cannabis was demonized. Reefer Madness, that left a mark, uh, leading into 1937 when it was criminalized through the Marijuana Tax Act. Fast forward to 1970, President Richard Nixon added cannabis to the Controlled Substance Act, placing cannabis at Schedule One, which is the worst substance level, along with heroin, as having uh, no medicinal properties, a high rate for addiction, and very damaging hazardous to the health. 
And then of course, in the 1980s, the war on drugs occurred. This is a, uh, a very dark time, I think, in our country's history. If you look at this graph here, the population of, of our prison population skyrocketed as a result of the war on drugs. The US has 4% of the world's population and 22% of its prisoners, driven primarily by this war on drugs. And oh, by the way, if your skin is brown, you're four times more likely to go to jail. But where are we at now? So eight states in the United States have legal laws, Washington, Oregon, Colorado, Alaska, California, Nevada, Massachusetts, Maine. 28 states have medical cannabis, meaning more Americans live today in a state with medical or legal cannabis than illegal cannabis. We're at the proverbial tipping point. Did you also know that there have been 23,000 studies uh, published on the cannabis plant, making it the most studied plant in human history, more than aspirin? And despite the overwhelming evidence that suggests there are a, a number of wonderful medicinal properties of the plant, it's still Schedule I. Um, I did the math on this. In order to uh, essentially have hypothetically a lethal dose for cannabis, you need to smoke 40,000 joints in 15 minutes. <laughs> I don't think Snoop could do that. Maybe, I don't know. You have to consume 10.2 million edibles to overdose in 15 minutes. I did the math on this too. If you line them up one after the other, it goes all the way to California. You're not, there, there is currently no lethal overdose for cannabis. And that's why it's of such great interest to researchers and companies like Deep Cell that are developing cannabis, medicines, recreational products, what have you. There's a wonderful opportunity with this plant. Look at public opinion. It's, it's shifted quite a bit. In 1969, 12% of the people said it should be legal. Now we're at over 60%. There is a wave of reform sweeping this world right now. And it's no coincidence that at the time we're understanding the plant, legalization is also occurring. I want to make that connection again. As we research the plant, more reform is happening. So as we liberalize the laws around cannabis, more research will happen, and so on and so forth. I think we are currently living in a historic moment, the end of global prohibition of cannabis. Public opinion. So, uh, a poll was done earlier this year on should people have access to medical marijuana of Americans. And it came in at 93% of the respondents said that it should be available. I've been in politics for part of my career. This is incredible. This is almost everyone. And I looked in terms of approval polls or approval ratings, what's next on that list? Firefighters. Cannabis polls higher than firefighters <laughs> or nurses or our armed, brave armed service people. Even polls higher than cats. <laughs> white pants. Dude's pretty fly. I was actually going to wear white pants. Bad, bad call for me. At the bottom of the list, you can imagine who brings up the rear in this particular list. Politicians, lawyers, and car salesmen. <laughs> Americans got that right. I made up the part about the cats and the white pants, but you get the point. <laughs> the point. There's a great deal of medical research happening with cannabis, uh, bone repair, multiple sclerosis, epilepsy pain, cancer, anti-inflammation, antibiotic properties. It's been shown that cannabinoids, the properties in cannabis, can kill things like MRSA. You heard of MRSA before, right? Resist antibiotics, can hurt people. My former business partner's wife died from MRSA. She was a paramedic. Didn't have to be that way. But of course, it's not all rainbows and unicorns. Anyone here had an edible or too many edibles before? I've been there, right? It can be scary sometimes. I've been this guy, right? <laughs> Felt like my soul was leaving my body. It was just kind of scary. <laughs> Got to be careful. Also in adolescence, uh, for young adults, uh, their brains are very sensitive to cannabis. You got to be very careful that children and youth do not have access to the plant. Nature as a chemist. This is the godfather of cannabis. This is the man who discovered THC in 1964. And he wondered, why did it take until 1964? For 5,000 years, it's been medicine. We didn't know what was happening. He figured it out. In 1805, morphine was derived from opium. 1855, cocaine from coca leaves. Why until 1964, we had no idea what was happening in the plant or in the body and the brain. He figured it out. He discovered THC. Entourage effects. So we live in the era of single molecule therapy, right? You take a, a pill for a thing. So by show of hands, uh, and keep them raised so we can see how widespread this is. Anyone taken Ambien or melatonin to sleep? Anyone ever taken Benadryl for allergies? Anyone ever taken aspirin for pain? Viagra. Man, those hands went down fast, right? <laughs> you, sir, thank you for your honesty back there. 
the point here is that this is not how cannabis works in the body and the brain. There's no such thing as a runner's high pill because when you run, a complex series of things and reactions and chemistry happens in the body and the brain. And that's how cannabis works on the body and the brain. You can't just take THC or CBD and have them uh, work like you think they would in the plant or in, if you were to smoke the plant or consume the plant. It's, it's not addition, it's multiplication. When these things work together, you add complexity and that's how nature works. What does the future hold? I look at cannabis as the most unique American thing happening today. Look at our democracy. Look at the violence, look at the incivility. You got congressmen body slamming reporters. You have suspicion, whether it's true or not, of collusion and corruption in our government. This, what's happening in cannabis, is, is uniquely American. This is of the people, by the people, for the people. This is not Washington DC politicians, this is not state capitals legalizing cannabis, this is the people demanding a better alternative. So if you were to ask me, I believe it's medicine, I believe it can help people, I believe we're witnessing the end of prohibition, so let's end where we began with my sister. Her story and my family's story is not unique in America today, but it doesn't have to end that way. There are better solutions. But don't take it from me. You can just ask my sister, Sasha. Thank you for your time.